I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. afternoon. It's an honor to welcome you on behalf of the Manhattan Institute to a celebration of the life and legacy of one of the most luminous and consequential figures of our age, William F. Buckley. An old friend and neighbor of Bill's in Connecticut was grumbling the other day about not being invited to his funeral. It was, he said, limited to closest friends and family members, which with such a very big and close family amounted to a pretty sizable crowd. I began to think about what kind of space you'd need to hold all those who think themselves Bill's intellectual descendants. Yankee Stadium would overflow. It would take something like Times Square on New Year's Eve, at least. Our panelists, some of Bill's most august intellectual heirs will speak in detail about his ideas, and they'll tell you about his heroic accomplishments of creating a thoughtful and powerful American conservatism almost single-handedly. But it occurs to me how prescient Bill was in forging not only the content of our conservatism, but also the vehicles for spreading it. From the outset of his career, in God at Man at Yale, he saw that the universities were trying to indoctrinate their charges with a monolithic liberal worldview, a trend that has only strengthened over time. How to do an end run, how to do an end run around the profs. Nowadays, when two or three conservatives are gathered together, their reflex response to this question is to start a magazine. <laughs> But half a century ago, founding National Review as a kind of counter-university was a stroke of original genius. Add to that the genius of making it so literate, so intelligent, so witty, and so pertinent a magazine, with such talented writers, guided and fired up with enthusiasm by so dazzling a skipper, and so well-trained that in his absence, they can man the helm with perfect skill and confidence. Not content with one medium, Bill also conceived firing line through which, the lo through, through which, as the longest running talk show host in TV history, he brought his worldview not just to thousands, but to millions. A magazine, they say, is the length and shadow of its editor, his character as well as his mind. And NR's wit, literacy, intelligence, iconoclasm, and courage are Bill through and through. He was, in addition, urbane, gracious, playful, zestful, life-affirming, tireless, and gallant. As editor, broadcaster, nurturer of talent, speechmaker, musician, novelist, yachtsman, and power broker, he accomplished what would take others two or three lifetimes. His friend Taki writes that on one skiing jaunt in Switzerland with Bill, he himself went out gambling at night, while Bill, quote, wrote a few books, played the harpsichord, wrote a few columns, taped a few shows, ran for mayor. It seemed like that. And all this he did with what Burke called the unbought grace of life. He was the perfect incarnation of the democratic Republican gentleman, improving upon the graces of the old world by joining them to the energy and openness of the new. In this, as well as teaching us how to think, he taught us how to be. Moderating our proceedings will be National Review senior editor Jay Nordlinger, whose recent collection of pieces it is entitled Here, There, and Everywhere. Aptly, after all, 
Jay is the music critic of the New Criterion and the New York Sun, as well as an editor and writer on politics, foreign affairs, and the arts for NR. Newspapers these days, it's well known, are having to make do with smaller and smaller staffs. With Jay, they could manage with a staff of one. <laughs> Jay Nordlicker. Well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I suppose this is on, and you can hear me. What a sweet and eloquent statement. Thank you so much, Myron. Uh, there are a handful of books, I'd like to say, that really help us understand contemporary America, and The Dream and the Nightmare is one. But that doesn't mean that Myron's other books can be neglected. And that is one that stands out. Thank you again, Myron, and thank you to the Manhattan Institute. Well, this is uh, Bill Day, Bill Buckley Day, but when you work in our world, especially National Review world, every day is a kind of Bill Day. And um, what, a, what a thrilling character he, I guess I have to say was. I must say it's been hard for me to speak about him in the past tense. He's quite present to, to me. I was always talking about how, how thrilling he was. Uh, he was smart, he was kind, he was large-hearted. But such a thrill to be around him with that dazzling smile. I must say, even at the end, when he was very ill and uh, infirm, enfeebled, he would say. He always spoke of his, certainly in the last year, he spoke of his enfeeblement. Even so, you could see through that to the real Bill Buckley, that same spirit, that same charisma, still a rock star. And um, he meant a whole lot to us, privately and publicly. And we'll, we'll talk about him some more today. He's, he was such a large figure and such a big subject, a vast subject. And I guess we'll just... Uh, We'll chip away a little bit and talk about some aspects of Bill. And to do this, we have four worthy panelists and uh, FOB, friends of Bill. And each is going to make a kind of opening statement, as in presidential debates or, or co-appearances, as some people call them. Uh, we have Rich Lowry, or, or Richard Lowry, as Bill wanted him to be known in the pages of National Review. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Rich is the third editor of National Review, following Bill and Bill's great friend, our great friend, John O'Sullivan. Rich is the author of a book called Legacy, which is about Bill Clinton. And it seems now there won't have to be another book called Legacy about another President Clinton, but uh, we'll hold on. Charles Kessler is a political scientist and professor at Claremont McKenna College, all around intellectual. He is the editor of the Claremont Review of Books, which is a publication that meets a great need. And years ago, Charles co-edited a book, a volume with Bill, called Keeping the Tablets, Readings in American Conservatism. It holds true. Roger Kimball is co-editor and co-publisher of The New Criterion and The Han Show of Encounter Books. That's another invaluable institution. Roger's written many books himself working his, his way up to almost a Buckleyan level. And finally, George Will, who has long been Bill's partner and columny, as William Sapphire would say. George Will is simply one of the finest political and social writers of our time, or any time. So we'll have those opening statements, and it's a little crowded up here. I'm going to try to wedge between the podium and here. And I'm not going to be quite as ruthless about time as Bill would have been. I, I don't have a clipboard or a stopwatch. But we'll say about five minutes, and I may do a little tapping. But uh, without further ado, the editor of National Review, Rich Lowry. Thanks so much, Ted. Thanks, Jay, and thanks to the Manhattan Institute for sponsoring this event, and to Myron Magnet for his uh, very warm introduction. I'm going to start just on some personal notes because I, I think the kind of influence Bill had on me personally, he had on many, many uh, people, uh, except I also had the honor and privilege of working closely with him for about 10 years. I discovered Bill Buckley when I was a teenager through Firing Line, and as soon as I saw it, I was just absolutely 
captivated. I would uh, record it on a VCR. I would uh, rewind and watch over and over again the bits I had trouble following. As you can tell, I wasn't a very popular or well-adjusted teenager. <laughs> what, uh, what Playboy was to most red-blooded American boys my age, National Review became to me, and I coveted every issue. I uh, snuck it into school, and it was really kind of an education to me. And then I had the, you know, the incredible honor of Bill appointing me editor of National Review. And, and we've talked, heard today a lot about all of Bill's many, many talents from sailing to skiing to playing the harp harpsichord. But when he picked me as editor, uh, the first thing he did was take me, it was in the fall, take me to Sharon, Connecticut, uh, to spend Thanksgiving with his family. And let me assure you of the many skills Bill had driving was not one of them. He had this... <laughs> He had this huge station wagon. It's like something, you know, family station wagon out of the 70s. And as we were uh, driving, loosely speaking, uh, along these dark, you know, windy roads in Connecticut, I thought, you know, this is either the opportunity of a lifetime or an elaborate plot to kill me. You know, I, I don't know which, but uh, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And just let me give you three observations about Bill from working uh, with him closely. One, even though as a conservative... He rever revered our past. Temperamentally, he wasn't like that at all. You know, um, Barack Obama quoted that famous uh, Faulkner line about the past isn't dead, it's not even past, the other day when he was justifying the hateful effusions of his preacher. Um, <laughs> Bill, I'm sure, believed that in some level, but temperamentally he was not like that at all. And when I first started editing National Review, inevitably I didn't know what, what I was doing, and things would go wrong, and I would take these problems and mistakes to him you know, with great trepidation, and he was just a great one for moving on. Whatever had happened was in the past, and he wanted to focus on the future and how to fix it. And someone said uh, in, in the great outpouring of commentary, um, about him upon his death, that Bill's attitude to life was always forward. And that's absolutely true. And that relates to a second great quality of Bill's that I would call a, a productive impatience. If you wanted to make Bill angry and you worked for him or hypothetically edited his magazine, there was no way to do it like lingering over some problem or procrastinating because that was so alien to his nature. He hated it to his core. And I remember him once telling me very early on that there was nothing he loved so much as a deadline. And most of us instinctively hate deadlines. And that didn't uh, make sense to me for a long time until it slowly dawned on me what should have been obvious, which is that you don't write 6,000 columns and 50 books without a, a worshipful devotion to deadlines. And that's what Bill had. And the third quality I would, I would mention, and Ramesh my colleague Ramesh has pointed this out. Bill was a great respecter of individuals. At these dinners he would have every other a night at his apartment at 73rd and Park, he would literally have a former Secretary of State sitting to the left of him and a 21-year-old intern sitting to the right of him, and he would be equally interested in each of them, equally gracious uh, towards each of them, and equally concerned about making each of them feel at ease. And um, Bill himself was a great individual. And I think this was at the root of one of the um, you know, most important passions of his life, which was his anti-communism. No one was so sui generis as Bill Buckley. And I want to get a little points for using a Latin phrase, uh, Jay, on this, on this occasion. But you know, the man traveled with his own brand of peanut butter. And no one would have uh, been you know, jailed or executed faster in a totalitarian system than Bill Buckley. So I think his anti-communism was not just a philosophic and a religious commitment, but also, in a way, a, a deeply personal one. And I'll just conclude on this note, we've all and all the remembrances of, of Bill across the ideological spectrum that have been so warm, I think we have to guard against making him just a cuddly figure. Uh, his anti-communism was a fighting faith. And when it came to that, he was uh, a cold-eyed rhetorical killer. And he was on an absolute crusade to end the evil empire. And it's his most important accomplishment that he helped to do that. And just on a concluding note, um, 
the last couple of weeks, I've had occasion to think a lot about and return to a concluding paragraph in a speech Bill gave uh, in the late 1980s. And I just want to share it with you, and I think you'll understand why it's been on my mind. This is what he said. To fail to experience gratitude when walking through the corridors of the Metropolitan Museum, when listening to the music of Bach or Beethoven, when exercising our freedom to speak, is to fail to recognize how much we have received from the great wellsprings of human talent and concern that gave us Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Mark Twain, our parents, our friends. We need a rebirth of gratitude for those who have cared for us, living and mostly dead. The high moments of our way of life are their gifts to us. We must remember them in our thoughts and in our prayers and in our deeds. Thank you very much. Well, that was great, Rich. Thank you so much. And all very true, including the, the driving. He might, he might say, can I... Can I pick you up at the train station? Oh, oh no, no, it's all right. I'll, I'll, yeah. take a, I'll take a cab. It's okay. <laughs> Charles Kessler of Claremont. Um, thanks very much, Jay, and thank you, Myron Magnet, and uh, my thanks to the Manhattan Institute and to National Review. It's an honor to be here today. I thought I would say something uh, briefly and somewhat impressionistically about Bill's political ideas, uh, about his actual political thought. Uh, he helped to create a conservative movement that was drawn from many discordant elements, uh, libertarians, traditionalists, uh, anti-communists, and sort of national interest uh, conservatives. Uh, and he helped them all keep house together by force of his own personality and his own gentle diplomacy, and of course by the influence of his own example. And his example consisted of two things, his own personality, his grace, his incredible capacity for friendship, which helped to bridge many of the uh, arguments and, and discords that the early conservative movement and even the editorial board of National Review suffered from. But it also consisted of his ideas, because he had a set of, of fundamental and I think fairly consistent ideas throughout his career, which helped him to moderate the conflicts that would arise from one wing or another of conservatism. So let me say something briefly about that. Um, as a boy, uh, he'd imbibed deeply from the aristocratic anti-statism of Albert J. Nock, who was uh, a friend of his father's and who spent time at the Buckley House in Sharon. So Bill sort of grew up with him as a sometime uh, a guest and member of that household. Uh, Albert J. Nock, endorsed H.L. Uh, Mencken's view that the state is the enemy of all well-disposed, decent, and industrious men. Uh, though, unlike uh, Mencken, Nock took pains to try to find a respectable American pedigree for that insight in Thomas Jefferson's thought. But uh, Nock d dissented from Jefferson's confidence in universal public education and went far beyond Jefferson in his comprehensive disdain for politics which, agreeing with Thomas Carlyle, he used to dismiss as the preoccupation of the quarter educated. Uh, at Yale, Bill Buckley encountered not only leftist economics and irreligion, which he excoriated in his first book, God and Man at Yale, but also Wilmore Kendall, the young political scientist uh, who became his mentor. And I think if, if, if anyone was Bill's mentor, it really was uh, Kendall. He, as I'll say in a moment, he had many... Uh, men whose intellects he admired and whose books and teachings he imbibed. But Kendall had a certain, I think, uh, was sort of primus inter pares, if I may use a term that Rich would respect. Uh, uh, Kendall was uh, Knox opposite in almost every respect. He was a Democrat, a kind of Democrat, a student of Rousseau, in fact, a majoritarian, uh, and uh, he taught, that is, uh, Kendall taught, that every society is by necessity a closed society, defined by a consensus of opinion on right and wrong. Uh, even the most open society has to make up its mind to be a, an open society and to remain an open society. And if it doesn't make up its mind to be that, it won't, it won't be an open society for very long. It was Kendall, I think, in large part, who taught uh, Bill Buckley that uh, liberal relativism is, in a way, the deepest enemy, philosophical enemy, that, that conservatism had to confront. 
Um, Kendall's teaching on this front could be summed up in a, in, in a sentence or so, which is that relativism asserts that th there's no such thing uh, as truth, but of course, relativism itself must be true <laughs> for that to be correct. And that fundamental contradiction is what Kendall called the Achilles heel of relativism. Uh, Buckley learned that lesson uh, very uh, deeply as a young man and employed it um, again and again. Um, his criticisms of Yale and his defense of Senator Joseph McCarthy were really of a piece. In each case, Buckley responded to what he regarded as a threat to the American consensus or to the American orthodoxy, the thing that made America America. Uh, and whether this was creeping relativism and socialism in the classroom or indifference to communist infiltration in Washington and Hollywood, uh, the threats were equally insidious and in a way the same. The anti-McCarthyites were so obsessed with the senator's methods that they dismissed the whole danger of communist influence. They seemed ready to sacrifice the end, the survival of free government, for the means, a fastidious due process. In any event, the result was effectively to strengthen communism, Buckley argued, by spawning legions of anti-anti-communists. Similarly, on college campuses, the professors were so obsessed with what uh, he call, Buckley called the superstitions of academic freedom that they forgot that this freedom was properly for the sake of discovering and teaching truth. Having dedicated themselves to an elaborate defense of the pursuit of truth, they didn't want to think about their responsibilities when they actually found some. And so academic freedom became an end in itself and truth became optional, maybe even non-existent. Now, in later years, I would say Buckley moderated the anti-statism of, of his youth uh, and uh, moved in, in certain respects at least towards a, uh, a more directly or more responsibly, you might say, political uh, orientation. Uh, in 1997, he said, the, the proper challenge of conservatives is to tame the state that is to habituate it and limit it to its proper ends, not to abolish it. But he actually has very little to say about the principal means of limiting American government, namely the Constitution. In fact, he has very, he has very few political heroes. It's one of the interesting things about Buckley. Um, he could talk about uh, Winston Churchill. He could refer to Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson and others. But he was not really that interested in them, I would say. And he didn't make them into sort of models uh, for conservatism or for his own uh, enterprises. Perhaps Ronald Reagan came closest to being a hero of Buckley's, a political hero of Buckley's, but I don't think Bill was in any danger of confusing Reagan with Pericles. Uh, as a survivor and critic of the 20th century, Bill remained more impressed by the evil the government can do than by the good. And so his heroes were really the thinkers, I think, who, who make civilization and conservatism possible. Among his contemporaries, men like James Burnham, Milton Friedman, Whitaker Chambers, and others. To the extent that Bill had, as it were, political heroes, it was those um, intellectuals, I would say. Um, let me conclude. Uh, I, I could certainly say more about the, the, the changes in his thought in the 1960s and the 1970s when in opposition to the new left, uh, Bill became uh, in a way uh, less aristocratic and less concerned in defending the aristocratic heritage of conservatism and more interested in defending the fundamental way of life of Americans uh, in all its democratic uh, splendor and excess uh, against the revolutionary attacks of the new left and uh, other uh, radicals uh, um, on the campus and off. Let me just close with a quotation from a speech of Bill's in which he discussed uh, the, the point of view of his hero, Blackford Oakes, the hero of his, uh, at least some of his novels. Um, we live in an age, Bill wrote, when what matters most is the survival of basic distinctions. Blackford Oakes, the hero of his spy novels, understands this, incarnates it, in fact. Blackford's basic assumption, Bill wrote, is that the survival of everything we cherish depends on the survival of the culture of liberty, and that this hangs on our willingness to defend this extraordinary country of ours, so awfully mixed up so much of the time, 
It goes so schizophrenic in its understanding of itself and its purposes, so crazily indulgent of its legion of wildly ungovernable miscreants. We must defend it at all costs. With it all, this idealistic republic, Bill writes, is the finest bloom of nationhood in all recorded time. And save only that God may decide that the land of the free and the home of the brave has outrun its license on history, we Americans must contend, struggle, and if necessary, fight for America's survival. Thanks. You know, uh, Charles, one of my questions today was going to be, was Bill really American, or was he too worldly for that? But I think you've answered that pretty well, so I'll skip that question later on. <laughs> and I want to mention about Roger, something you may have heard Henry Kissinger say today in his eulogy. Roger is the owner or co-owner co -owner of Bill's boat, Patito, which is Spanish for a duckling or a ducky, and Bill and his wife Pat called each other ducky, and I once referred to dinner at their house as Ducky versus Ducky. But <clears throat> Roger does more than race yachts. He is an editor and publisher and writer, Roger Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And thanks to the Manhattan Institute. Is, is this on? I think so. Yeah. Good. Um, well, being asked to expatiate on Bill Buckley's contributions to public life it's a little bit like being sandbagged with one of those famous conundrums that the scholastic philosophers are always being accused of propounding. You know, the thing, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Can God create a stone so heavy that he cannot lift it? That sort of thing. Mutatis mutandis, if I <laughs> can. Uh, uh, so now the pressure's on George <laughs> Will. I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll perform. <laughs> He, he might one-up us with Greek. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the vertiginous sense of inadequacy such interrogations inspire leaves you, I think, either mute or at best repeating like Elizabeth Barrett Browning, let me count the ways. Since that, uh, the sad morning of February 27th when Bill died sitting at his desk, continuing his contributions to public life, the world has poured forth a veritable library of grateful recollection, registering his many achievements, and we've heard about many of them today. The creation and nurture of National Review, the creation and nurture of Firing Line, a list of books written, edited, introduced, that cannot but instill unchristian feelings of envy in any aspiring writer, and on and on and on. But this catalog of achievement, impressive though it is, formed merely the integument, the sort of outer envelope of Bill Buckley's activities and contribution to public life. The core, I think, centered around a twofold conviction and an accident of temperament. The conviction was, first of all, that liberty is essential to our humanity, but second, that genuine liberty requires acknowledgement of what transcends and gives direction to our endeavors, to our liberty. In other words, that genuine liberty requires faith. Bill's embrace of liberty made him, famously, the scourge of political tyrants who would trample upon freedom, and also latitudinarian anarchists who would beguile us with counterfeit substitutes. Yet the withering lucidity of his rhetoric has sometimes obscured the fact that unlike ma many able polemicists, he was a profoundly non- or even anti-ideological character. He was conservative, yes. He assiduously followed St. Paul's directive to speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. But Bill's conservatism was fundamentally a creature of amplitude. Like Walter Badgett, the English 19th century English writer, he knew that the essence of Toryism was an, is enjoyment. And this brings me to the accident of temperament I mentioned. Whatever else it was, Bill's life was an affidavit of enjoyment, a record of an homage to a life greatly and gratefully enjoyed. What delight he took in, well, everything, playing the piano or harpsichord, savoring a glass of vino verde, dissecting the latest news from Washington, 
inspecting with wonder the capabilities of email and internet service on a BlackBerry handheld. It has often been remarked that Bill rescued conservatism from its sect-like status as a talisman of, for the perpetually disgruntled. This is true. It is also the case that he honed that broad church conservatism into an effective weapon in the battle against the enormity of communism and its many bureaucratic domestications. The magnificent victory over Soviet tyranny at the end of the 1980s led some observers to conclude that the work of conservatism was finished, or at least now to be redeployed in the department of mopping up operations. Bill never made that mistake. He knew that the totalitarian temptation was an abiding feature of modern life, and he was ever alert to its insinuations in the beguiling rhetoric of egalitarianism and statist dispensation. The question was never whether socialism and all its works were an encroaching evil. That, for Bill, I think, was axiomatic. The question was rather, what were the most effective responses to these evils? And note the plural. Bill understood that the battle against socialism, against the incursions of state power into the interstices of everyday life, was a battle that embraced more than politics. Or perhaps I should say that he understood that politics, the politics of liberty, could only succeed in a world where individual prerogative triumphed over politics. In many of the re recollections by Bill's friends, you will find a sentence that, edged with some surprise, tells you that conversations with Bill seldom revolved around politics. Music, yes. Books, to be sure. Sailing, you bet. The plot of his latest novel, ditto. But politics, in any ordinary sense, was but an intermittent object of attention, subservient to more humanizing concerns. And here I think of Charles Kessler's uh, notion of politics in this sense being the province of the quarter educated. The important thing to understand is that Bill's devotion to private pursuits was not in conflict with his conservative political <coughs> determination, but rather it was a fulfillment of it. Part of Bill's political genius was to realize the limits of politics. Now, this may sound paradoxical for a conservative thinker, but I believe that it brings us to the center of Bill's contribution to public life. Bill touched and improved countless lives. He created and nurtured a score of important institutions. He was part of that tonic that revitalized the appetite for ordered liberty and helped defeat one of the most monstrous tyrannies in history. It speaks, I think, less to the irony than to the amplitude of Bill's vision that he undertook these initiatives, not to further a political agenda, but to rescue us from one. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. George Will. An Austrian politician in the 19th century, having come to power with the help of all the liberal elements of Europe, was asked what he planned to do. He said, I plan to astonish the world with my ingratitude. <laughs> I'm about to commit an act of ingratitude, not certainly against Bill Buckley, to whom I am grateful for so many things, but against Princeton University, the hospitality of which I'm about to abuse, by saying that I think, looking to the continuing impact of Bill Buckley, Buckleyites, and we are all Buckleyites now, uh, have a job, and it is to continue digging out from under the debris of Princeton's President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, excavate far enough and you will find first principles. I believe that the most important political decision, the most consequential historic decision of the 20th century was the decision to locate the Princeton Graduate School where it is. Uh, I, 40 years ago today, 40 years ago this year, I got my doctorate from Princeton and had a wonderful time in the graduate school up on a hill. Woodrow Wilson didn't want it there. Woodrow Wilson wanted, and for all I know, he may have been right. Law of averages might have caught up with him. Um, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson wanted the graduate students down on the campus amidst the undergraduates. Uh, there was a big fight, as there often was around Wilson, and Dean West, his opponent, prevailed. Wilson, in a characteristic snet, resigned, went into politics, became governor, 
and the world was soon engulfed in war. Um, that may be, here you go, Rich, the post hoc, propter hoc fallacy. <laughs> but in fact, I do think that uh, B Bill Buckley and the movement he invigorated and the principles he stood for are very much the principles of recovery from Wilsonianism. In three senses, Woodrow Wilson was the first president ever to criticize the Founding Father, and he didn't do it tangentially, he did it frontally. He said the Constitution of the United States was fundamentally mistaken and fundamentally inappropriate for a country such as the United States had become with telegraph wires and steel rails and all the accoutrements of modern life that made the idea of limited government, inefficient government, inappropriate. Obviously it is the case, and those of us who believe that gridlock is the most beautiful word in the political lexicon, obviously it is the case that the founding fathers who went to Philadelphia in 1787 did not go there to design an efficient government. The idea would have appalled them. They went there to design a safe government. Hence we have a government full of blocking mechanisms, bicameral legislature, three branches of government, separation of powers, checks and balances, vetoes, veto overrides, judicial review and all the rest. This appalled uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he, you have to understand, this was a man not wedded to empiricism. He wrote a book called Congressional Government before even seeing Congress. Not bad, sooner just up the road at Johns Hopkins. Um, second, uh, he was the man who more than anything else, uh, more than anyone else, infused American foreign policy with a universalism that some of us find dangerous and certainly unconservative. Those of us who rally around the banner that a government that cannot run Amtrak is going to have its hands full with Iraq, uh, believe that uh, the Woodrow Wilson impulse is alive, well, and dangerous in our country. Which is to say there is a seamlessness in Woodrow Wilson's approach to politics, domestic and foreign, and that the opposition to that progressive tradition, as it's now called, must be, should be, logically is, similarly seamless. Furthermore, Woodrow Wilson is one of the architects, I would say the principal architect of the modern presidency. What Jeffrey Tullis, a great political scientist at the University of Texas, has well called the rhetorical presidency. Presidents, it's hard to imagine now, rarely spoke to the country. They didn't have the technological means to begin with but rarely spoke at all in the 19th century. They became garrulous with the coming of broadcasting and graphic journalism and movies and all the rest. It's not widely known that the baleful tradition we now have of presidents delivering the State of the Union address in person to Congress, the most dispiriting part of our civic liturgy, <laughs> where they introduce plain people and heroes and all from the balcony and all this sort of bad semi-Nuremberg-ian uh, <laughs> spectacle. That, that's a new thing. Thomas Jefferson uh, didn't like the sound of his voice and more to the point, considered it monarchical for the executive to stand before the people's representatives and declaim, simply sent the message up, which is all you're required to do. The Constitution says the president shall from time to time report and Jefferson from time to time reported. That wonderful tradition of executive reticence was broken by, needless to say, Woodrow Wilson, who thought it was the president's job to interpret the incohate yearnings of the country, the difference between interpretation and making it up being fairly small, uh, <laughs> the, uh, which uh, it seems to me defines a third strand of, of uh, the task of Bill Buckley's tradition going forward, and that is to concentrate conservatives' minds as it needs to be concentrated, the Republican Party having won seven of the last 10 presidential elections, to concentrate their mind that the presidency is a problem in our system. Not this or that president, but the office itself, which has under uh, uh, current administration grown even more swollen and some would say not unreasonably dangerous uh, than it has been hitherto. Uh, if I'm right that this is the continuing relevance of Bill's uh, 
thought it is because he did bring a kind of marvelous seamlessness to his approach to our politics. It's partly because he embodied and showed that you could gracefully and with good spirit embody what Frank Meyer called fusionism. I, I went to work for Bill for three years as the first Washington editor of National Review because while working on the Senate staff, I called Bill one day and said, you need a Washington editor. And he said, essentially, you're right and you're it. It was that kind of job interview people have had with Bill before. Fusionism, fusing the, the economic libertarian market-driven conservatives, the social, often religious conservatives, and the anti-communist conservatives. Uh, the truth being that uh, in the one good speech Jefferson did give, uh, his 1800 inaugural address, he said we famously, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans. All conservatives are libertarians, fusionists, anti-communists, anti-totalitarians. And we adjust the tensions as the context of the American argument requires us to. I am currently in the midst of a violent libertarian recoil against McCain-Feingold, which makes this presidential election very interesting for me. Never having had one before, I didn't have a dog in the fight. But uh, I think, as I say, we're all uh, participants in a constant adjustment of the impulses in conservatism that Bill Buckley held in marvelous and even alluring equipoise. What Bill understood most of all was what Barry Goldwater understood. When Barry first started to go into politics, I think he was running for the Phoenix City Council or something, he wrote a letter to his brother in which he said of politics, it ain't for life and it might be fun. Fun was the heart of the matter. If it isn't fun, get out of it because you're not going to do well. Uh, con for conservatism, for people like Buckley, cons Politics is fun because politics involves inherently the celebration of America's first principles. No conservative will ever, when it would occur to them to say, today for the first time I'm proud of my country. No conservative could say, and the same person said this, that America is a mean country. Because to be a conservative is to constantly be tr trying to polish clarify and apply first principles that we like and that define this creedal nation. Now, Ronald Reagan famously said, or perhaps not famously enough, Ronald Reagan did say, I do not want to go back to the past, I want to go back to the past way of facing the future. That is, in terms of the compass handed to us in the Constitution, in the Declaration by the thoughts and writings of our founders. That is what Bill did. Bill vivified these and made them relevant to running for president or running for mayor. And uh, that makes being conservatism, conservative an inherently cheerful undertaking. So be of good cheer. That is what Bill left us with. Thank you, George. Um, you gave it to Wilson worse than Taft or Theodore Roosevelt or Eugene Debs or Charles Evans Hughes ever did. Very rollicking. I'm going to ask a few questions of our panelists, starting with Rich. Now, most people know that Bill turned against the Iraq War after supporting it. He thought it was a hopeless enterprise. Some disagree. But he certainly didn't turn against the general war on terror. And I know that one of his last instructions to us was to give it to what some people call Islamofascism or jihadism. Uh, JFK spoke of a twilight struggle. This may be another one. Would you care to speak about that a minute? Sure. Let me uh, first associate myself with two things. Roger said, one, you know, to be around Bill was, was to feel the sense of envy and inadequacy. I remember when I finished the, um, the first and only book I've written, and I thought, wow, you know, I've caught up a little bit to Bill Buckley. But he'd written two books in the meantime, so I'd lost ground. Just, just it, wasn't, it wasn't fair. And, and the other thing that's absolutely spot on is Bill just was not that interested in, in practical 
politics for the reasons Roger outlined. I remember at these dinners, I mentioned these editorial dinners, I would go there and, and you know, spend sometimes all night just waiting, when do we get to talk about the real clear politics averages out of Pennsylvania? And oftentimes the answer was never, um, because he was, he was um, interested in arts and literature and his personal pursuits. On Jay's question, first of all, in the Iraq War, I think Bill would endorse um, most of what George Will just said, I remember um, watching the speech that Bush gave going in um, at Bill's apartment with some people, and it was about eight points um, Bush had justifying uh, the war, and I think maybe one of them had to do with spreading democracy to Iraq, and immediately Bill's reaction, that was too Wilsonian, that's too much, that's too moralistic, too idealistic, and uh, he had a lot of the same qualms that uh, George has expressed so powerfully about you know, what connections spreading democracy to Iraq would have to our national interest and doubts about um, how readily we could change Iraqi political culture through force. And some of those qualms, uh, unfortunately, have been borne out. But he did, at the end, and I say this as someone who monitored, monitored his writings and positions on Iraq very, very carefully, because uh, to say the least, it, um, having National Review have a different position on a major war than Bill Buckley was somewhat awkward. Uh, by the end, he, he tentatively supported the surge. In the last column he wrote after the Petraeus Crocker testimony in September, he said, well, if I had a vote, I'd vote for, for continuing to go down to this path, because it does seem to uh, be bearing some results in restoring order to the country and making possible some relatively successful outcome. But um, his opposition to the war has gotten a lot of attention, and it has obscured the point Jay raised, which is that he is absolutely committed to the broader war on terror. And at the end, he was talking a lot about Islamo-fascism and talking about it in Cold War terms, because he saw it, uh, I believe, as the same sort of anti freedom, anti-individual, and therefore anti-human um, philosophy that had been represented by communism during the Cold War. Thanks. Uh, Charles, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about Bill's vaunted versatility. You know, he uh, wrote books and wrote columns and lectured, and there were novels amid the books and television and all of this. And he would often say that his audiences didn't really overlap. Uh, there were column people, there were sailing people, there were Blackford Oaks people. And I had a little taste of this. I was talking once with someone in the music business, uh, a soprano, and she asked me where I worked, and I said National Review, and she didn't know what that was, which can be a good thing. And um, <clears throat> I said, well, it's a, a, an opinion journal founded in the mid-1950s by William F. Buckley, Jr. And she looked at me and said, not the spy novelist. Yes, one and the same. She knew him as a spy novelist, loved those novels, didn't know he had anything to do with political journalism. He did write a lot of books, and I want to know whether you think any of those books will last or whether Bill's impact is cumulative, uh, his entire body of work. And he wrote at such a fast pace and so, and so diversely. I wonder if you could talk a bit about Bill's books and their character, and also, just out of curiosity, do you have a favorite book, or a couple of favorite Buckley books? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, but a difficult one, because he wrote uh, you know, more than 50 books, and indeed more than 35 uh, books of nonfiction. Um, uh, and I think it's, um, it's likely that a few of those books will live, but not all of them, of course. Uh, God and Man at Yale has, a, has had an afterlife, despite the fact that it's um, uh, heavily invested in the reading lists of particular professors and the idiosyncrasies of Yale faculty um, at the time. Uh, my own impression is that, the, uh, that um, we, we could benefit from a Buckley reader mm. that would uh, put together some of his classic uh, pieces which, which lie at present uh, inside books that are out of print now. One of the, uh, I wrote a piece uh, in the uh, memorial issue of National Review on, on Bill 
uh, and I focus on his books, and I was surprised to find that the vast majority of his books are out of print, of his nonfiction books are out of print. Uh, even his collection of speeches, which came out just a few years ago, which is one of his best books and one of the best means of, of introduction to him, uh, let us talk um, of many things, was temporarily out of print. I'm glad to see that it's coming back into print and paperback uh, by basic books. But uh, almost all of the classic Buckley political books are unobtainable now, except at a used bookstore if you're, uh, if you're lucky. Um, the best introduction to him, I think, is the book of speeches and also Miles Gone By, his autobiography or his autobiographical writing, uh, which is a, a collection. collection of mm. things uh, put together in chronological order, more or less, so that you've got a f the flavor of, uh, of Buckley at work and play from his youth growing up in Sharon to his uh, uh, latest uh, uh, adventures. Um, those are the best introduction. Uh, I don't think there is a classic book um, that he wrote on politics um, that he wanted, of course, when he was a young man, to write a book, a big book on politics, a sort of book yeah. of political theory, There's in up fact. Up From Liberalism, which is a little book, and but it has that program at the end. And yes. Up From Liberalism is the best and most comprehensive indictment of liberalism, mm. I think, that he wrote. But it doesn't really say that much about conservatism. Here's something about Bill's writing. Um, you know, the 1965 New York mayoral race seems a long time ago. Yes. Uh, people have forgotten the winner, a Beam, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, or did he win later? Was it Lindsay? I don't Lindsay, remember. Lindsay, Beg your pardon. It was Beam and Lindsay and Buckley and maybe a couple of other fringies. And, but that book is dazzling. It's one of the most dazzling books about American politics I've ever read. Yes. And uh, Bill appeared uh, on The Tonight Show when it was hosted by Jack Parr a million years ago. But that essay is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it never goes dry. But he didn't really write a, a summa, did he? We, ha no. we have to find no. him in a whole bunch of things. And of course, those hundreds of hours of firing line tapes. That's right. God, uh, but uh, The Unmaking of a Mayor, which is his book on the uh, mayor election, is one of those that's out of print uh, and difficult to find. It is maybe of, of, the, of the directly political books he wrote the best mm. uh, and perhaps the most uh, enduring. Um, but it's, um, uh, I, 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 I think there is a need for a kind of summa volume put together from his various writings. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be a, a, a real contribution. Roger, we, we've talked today about Bill's great joie de vivre. You know, he had so much fun, Bill did, and he caused others to have fun. And I'll tell just a little story. It's a pretty typical one of Bill. We were in an airport on a Caribbean island. And the young woman behind the counter said, hey, are you famous? <laughs> and Bill said, yes, I am. And the young woman said, why? And he said, I'm a rock and roll star. <laughs> and you could tell Bill wasn't because he said rock and roll instead of rock. <laughs> anyway, he just, he, just, he loved fun and he loved being a, a, a star. And uh, conservatives are sometimes portrayed as a little bit morose and kind of unfun. You're fun. Everyone at this table is fun. Why do conservatives <laughs> sometimes have this image? And did Bill, uh, did Bill smash it entirely, or does that image linger, as I think it does? Oh, I think that image uh, does linger. Um, uh, partly, I think, because conservatives tend to be realists. And being realists, they... Um, uh, don't like utopian ideas. And since they don't like utopian ideas, uh, they tend not to be uh, uh, susceptible to the various sentimentalities that uh, elite liberal culture is purveying. And because they aren't susceptible, susceptible to those sentimentalities, uh, they are kind of a wet blanket on uh, people who talk about things like the audacity of hope and uh, it takes a village and uh, just to pick two terms arbitrarily. The emptiest out of the you hat, could find. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, 
You know, um, I remember um, uh, our friend uh, Bob Bork, uh, sometimes accused of having a pessimistic view of things, uh, hmm. uh, said, okay, well, my next talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it Little Mary Sunshine, to which <laughs> Cato Burns said, yeah, Little Mary Sunshine gets skin cancer. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, but now, do, I, do, we, do we know a funnier person yeah, than no, Bob Yeah, you see, this is this is my point. Um, uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm quite serious. Uh, yeah, Marvelous no, wit. Some of the audience may have misunderstood me. One of, one of the best wits, to, wits in the West. That's hard to say. One of the best wits in the West, Bob Bork. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, um, conservatives unfairly have this, this uh, view of being uh, morose, as you say, because although they're, they tend to be pessimistic about... Um, uh, humanity's chances for uh, perfection, they nonetheless, I think, pretty much across the board, with some exceptions, um, believe with Walter Badgett, that, that quote I, I, I drew from Walter Badgett, that the essence of Toryism, the essence of conservatism, is enjoyment. That, um, and something I wrote about Bill, I said that uh, he took the beginning of Genesis very seriously, that uh, God made the world and saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he believed uh, that we, we had an obligation to enjoy the world because it, it was good, it, uh, and, and it, was, it was almost a moral obligation mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to enjoy life mm -hmm. and to savor it, and, and he certainly did. Um, you know, I think it's the, you know, why is it that conservatives have, have this reputation? I, I just think it's, um, it has to do, uh, again, with their anti-utopianism and the fact that uh, the zeitgeist, as it is today, uh, is still suffering from that post-romantic uh, assault on humanity that is summarized by the term the 60s. Mm. And... Uh, you know, uh, th this too will pass, I believe. So um, mm, I when? count myself. <laughs> well, let's see. Yeah. It's in a <laughs> sooner or later. Roger, I, um, I read something interesting, as one always does, from Charles Moore, uh, by Charles Moore the other day. He was talking about writing and writers, and he said in the Spectator magazine over in England, and he said, there are writers who write for other writers, who write for their friends and enemies, maybe, who write for insiders and writers who write for readers. And uh, I believe that Bill wrote for readers and of course for, for everyone. What do you have to say of that? Uh, I think that's true. I mean, uh, Bill, uh, he's, you know, he it was, um, was a, an extraordinarily uh, nimble uh, stylist. Um, it could do many, many different things. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I believe that he, um, uh, he was the kind of the kind of writer who, uh, reading him, you always feel as though he's talking directly to you, which is um, that's a that's a, a great rhetorical talent mm -hmm. to to have. And he um, he was someone who, uh, in, in his writing and in, in, in his in his speaking, um, uh, kind of mastered the the art of the uh, uh, the second person personal, as, yeah. as it were. And, um, uh, but he did it in, a, in such a way that, uh, it, you know, some, some writers who use that, they, 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 they tend to lack dignity or, or um, uh, polish, and he, that certainly was not, not true of Bill. Well, Bill, I believe that in Bill there was a, an, an entertainment imperative. He thought he had to The entertainment entertain committee people, please never them. sleeps, he yes. used to like to say. Yes, that's right. And once he asked, uh, he was going to be absent from some large gathering. Uh, I, think he would, I think he was ill. And he said, well, do you think that would be okay? And I said, well, Bill, the, the world has to get along without you sometimes. And he said, but, but who will be clever? <laughs> and, he, and, he want, and who was? <laughs> you, maybe. <laughs> he wanted no one bored. Uh, George, I'd like to ask you whether... Bill ever gave you any advice, or did he just let you bloom into George F. Will? I'll come to that, but can I, uh, <laughs> can I respond a little bit to Roger, who's giving conservatives too much of a pass here on the gloominess content. Uh, Bob Bork. Defend gloominess for us? Well, I shall. Um, <laughs> pleasure has it, pessimism has its pleasures. You're right 90% of the time, and you're delighted to be wrong. Uh, but, uh, Bob Bork, who's one of my oldest and closest friends, is indeed witty, a Falstaffian mm. figure, Fabulous. great man. 
But I, it was in my living room that the book Slouching Toward Gamora was born. He and I were watching the Super Bowl, at the halftime of which Michael Jackson grabbed his crotch and Bob Bork grabbed his pen. And <laughs> it's approximately what happened. And I do think there is a case that conservatives tend to think American uh, institutions and virtues are more fragile than they are and to underestimate the recuperative powers of the country raise the marginal tax rate 4% and grass will grow in the streets of America's cities, elect the wrong president and the family will get weak. Again, what the connection between presidents and families eludes me. After all, um, the 1950s under Father Eisenhower were pregnant with the 1960s. These are more mysterious. Uh, kind of osmosis occurs in our society and we sometimes think. And, and frankly, as long as the Republican Party has the electoral configuration it currently has. That is, in the 2006 election, Republican candidates received more votes from evangelical Christians than Democratic candidates got from African Americans and union members combined. There is going to be a tendency for the Republican Party to be perceived as, fairly or unfairly, a party with a strong religious impulse that will sometimes strike and sometimes fairly strike other Americans as anti-fun, anti-pleasure, anti, you know, the old joke about certain religious people are opposed to sexual intercourse because they think it will lead to dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think there's a, I think there's a problem. I, I, th I think the dancing is rarer now. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but as to Bill's advice to me, um, no. When I first started writing a column, I asked Bill what the most common question I think uh, columnists are asked, do you ever have trouble coming up with a topic? And he said, no, the world irritates me three times a week. <laughs> and uh, that's in fact the case. I have a list in my wallet, I've had, I'll always have one, that uh, of the next ten columns I hope to get to. The world is just so interesting. And Bill, I was a problem for National Review from the start. First of all, um, I went to work for it in January 1973, and Nixon had been reelected. The 22nd Amendment was doing its work. National Review's edit, some of the National Review people were looking ahead and had decided that the next president should be Spiro Agnew, mm -hmm. who for some reason had taken a dislike to me. Um, but that got him. Well, I'd, I'd written a, a review of several books about him in which I'd, I'd said he wasn't Lincoln, and that got me in, <laughs> got me in trouble. But um, I went to work in January, I mean, the week I went to work for National Review, Sirica imposed the draconian sentence on McCord, McCord confessed, Watergate began to unravel. Mm -hmm. So I go to where all I'm writing about is Watergate. And I decided very early on that Nixon was guilty and he'd probably have to leave office. And national, there was a certain kind of conservative didn't really like Nixon until it was clear he was guilty. Uh, and then they rallied around him because... Those are the fun I know ones. the feeling. Yeah, because, because yeah. the New York Times and the Washington Post were against him. And the National Review at that time uh, would collate the mail they got and put it down into categories. And one category was subscription cancellations and George Will. Uh, Bill, and I was costing him money because National Review then as now, as most small magazines do, depended on a large S. And uh, it cost him money and he never said a syllable to inhibit me. I remember one day we were sitting around a large table in the, where the editorial conferences were and I was at one end, Bill was at the other, midst of Watergate, he said, what's going to happen? I said, this, uh, he's guilty and the system works, mm -hmm. meaning he'd leave. Bill with that Jack Nicholson smile of his says, <laughs> he's guilty and it doesn't work. <laughs> and we agreed to disagree. George, a couple of quickies. Um, what, what reach can a columnist have and can a television commentator have? How much good can one do in those roles? And you may want to relate it to Bill and also to uh, George Will. Well, Bill did, had to do something that because he did it, people like me didn't and don't have to do. That is to say, look, it's respectable to say certain things in polite society. It's okay to be a conservative. You don't have to do that anymore. 
Uh, this is now part of the mainstream argument, and that threshold question has been answered because of Bill. Uh, what, what, what you can do, however, is give people the vocabulary to think in. They say, well, I know, I think this, and now I know why I think that. And that's what Bill was so good at, particularly on television, because you could actually see him, see his mind work. You almost never see on television an honest-to-God conversation. That is, where you don't know where it's going. It's not scripted. It's not limited. There's ample time. Television, famously, is survival of the briefest, and he had an hour. So it was very different. So that's really, I think, what, what, what they do. I mean, you, of course, you can call uh, people's attention to things that are going on in Washington that a normal, healthy American doesn't pay any attention to, uh, card check, unionization, that yeah. kind of thing. But uh, basically, it is to give people a vocabulary by which they can apply their almost infallibly healthy instincts in this country uh, to the day-to-day -day episodes of government. It reminded me of something. Myron Magnet said something that, that very much resonated with me. I've said it before, that, that Bill, he didn't teach us what to think, but he did help us in, in how to think. Uh, very good about, about process. And, of course, if you came to his conclusions, that was just fine. But process, uh, very important. And would you settle something for me, uh, George, or, or try to? It has to do with conservatism and libertarianism. Uh, Bill said, within every conservative is a streak of libertarianism. The question becomes, how wide is your streak? And he once, I thought this was mischievous, but he once subtitled a, a collection of his, Reflections of a Libertarian Journalist. What was he? And what are we? We're conservatives, are we not, with some streak of libertarianism, of varying wits? Yes, he's a conservative, but what he was trying to conserve was, first of all, the idea that we are a constitutional government of delegated, enumerated, and limited powers. He was trying to say we are conservatives in a country that famously devours its past, relentlessly forward-looking, as de Tocqueville said. So he's a conservative in a country in which conserving is to conserve the framework of rapid change, of upward mobility and all the rest. So, I mean, there is famously difficult for Americans to apply a, the European concept of conservatism to a very un-European country. But he was a conservative as we mean that. Rich, um, let's talk a little bit more about working for Bill. Um, in, in my experience, maybe you share it, there was nothing better than being praised by him, than being approved of by him. And nothing stung more than being criticized by him or, or rebuked. And I once said to him, I feel sorry for you, Bill, because you can't act normally and say what you want. Because we love you so, you send us into therapy when you say critical words. Um, we'll never have quite another superior like him, will we? No, that's absolutely right. Um, if I just say something about... Uh to illustrate the uh, wisdom of George Will's point about pessimism and, and um, the circumstances in which uh, Bob Bork started his book, Slouching Towards Gamora, we would all consider it, at this juncture of time, a great and wonderful thing if Michael Jackson were only grabbing his, his own <laughs> crotch at a Super Bowl, <laughs> Super Bowl show. Um, Bill was going to Myron's point, Jay, about um, Bill teaching us how to think. There's a, a, a word he loved to use critically uh, of anything that appeared at Nash, in National Review that he thought was insufficiently argued, and that was attitudinizing. Attitudinizing was just making an assertion or stating an opinion with nothing to back it up and with no argument behind it. So if you're going to call liberals brain dead, don't do it unless you can mm. prove it. Mm. <laughs> and if you can't, don't say it. And he really hated that. Um, but Bill is a great enthusiast for other people's work. He was never so delighted when someone said, I'm, you know, I just got a book contract. His whole face uh, would, would light up in joy or when someone just finished a book or if someone's book made the bestseller list. He, he just really reveled in other people's success and there's nothing he wanted so much as other people to be productive writers like himself. But he also... Um, I, I, let me say, I remember sure. how pleased he was when the Weekly Standard magazine was founded. Uh, another one of his offspring, in a sense. And it speaks to his generosity and also the fact that his eye was on the prize. It wasn't selfish. 
Right. It was about the advancement of conservatism. But I loved his line about the weekly standard, puckish line at some point, a very distinguished uh, weekly that is aspiring to become a fortnightly. Yeah. <laughs> So, but when but the when the Republic went that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But when there was something in NR he didn't like, um, you know, poor phrasing or whatever, he could be extremely pointed uh, in his criticism, and nothing was so wounding as that. And you know, the big gap I feel now, yawning gap, as an editor is getting Bill's approval was the standard of success. <laughs> Nothing else mattered. And now every single issue of the magazine, I'll be left wondering. Well, we can still imagine his approval or disapproval, I think. <laughs> let's, let's imagine him approving. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Charles, um, when Milton Friedman died, which was recent, there was a bit of triumphalism about our kind of economics, a free economy. We've won. We've vanquished socialism. Do you ever really win? Uh, did Bill win? Did Friedman win? Or is it constant tilting against the socialists and the collectivizers? Well, some victories, I, I, it's a constant uh, battle, but some uh, victories along the way are larger and more important than others. I mean, the collapse of the Soviet Union was epical because it meant not only our chief adversary's demise, but also the discrediting of socialism as an alternative model. Uh, that discrediting is not permanent, however. I mean, socialism still has uh, a residual moral appeal. It will have an economic appeal again if uh, the gyrations in the stock market uh, are severe enough, uh, if there's a downturn that is uh, steep uh, enough and lasts long enough. Um, it's impossible to, uh, there's an eternal battle between right and wrong. And I think Bill was uh, highly aware of that. And so there's a sense in which um, the politics is always going to be uh, messy. It can be, uh, there are better periods and worse periods, of course, and conservatism has come through some very important uh, victories at the end of the 20th century. But in a way, if you look back at the 20th century as a whole, it's a liberal century. Yeah. I mean, our politics, in, in, though it in, moved in, in right. In the bad or good sense, Charles? In the bad sense. In the American liberal sense, right. Yes, in the, in the bad sense. Uh, I mean, the, the structure of the government, the size of the government, the functions and ambitions of the government have all been immeasurably increased from the t partly in, in, uh, as a result of Woodrow Wilson's inspiration and his students and students of students. Uh, conservatism has had its innings at the end of the century, but really, uh, I mean, only in the 1980s did conservatism begin to win important political battles that would define the generation, mm -hmm. as it were, uh, uh, up until the present. But as you can see from the contemporary presidential contest, the, the effects of those conservative victories and the victories of conservative principle are ultimately um, evanescent mm. if conservative intellectual thought is not renewed. I mean, it's every generation has to sort of rediscover the things that Buckley helped us to discover and, uh, and, uh, and make so beautifully memorable. And, and part of his discontent with contemporary conservatism what goes exactly uh, to that point. He was dismayed not just by the Iraq War, but at the failures of, of conservatives to truly limit government. Well, let's say that, that this November uh, a Democrat wins the presidency, and that president and Congress give us what is now called national health care. Does National Review just start over and start explaining to people again why socialized medicine is a bad idea, or do we just bank on experience? Well, to a large extent, what conservatism um, has done in certain fields is exactly that. I mean, uh, we have, on, if you look at conservatism on the Supreme Court, which is a narrow field, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of what we call conservatism has been uh, the gradual grudging acceptance of liberal precedents from yeah. the 1960s and 1970s and saying no farther than this. But as, in terms of rolling back those decisions, not much really has been achieved by conservatism. Uh, you know, in that sense, the um, uh, national health care would be, of course, a tremendous defeat for us. But I don't see the alternative to a kind of philosophical renewal at the same time that you're trying to wage a policy war. 
But you can't win the policy war in the long run if there's not a philosophical renewal along the way, too, I think. Roger, we're going to take, in, in a couple of minutes, some questions from our audience. But I first want to ask you um, about being at Bill's in, in Stamford. Uh, you were there pretty much every Sunday afternoon or evening, I, I think. And uh, what was it like? What was it like being there? Um, well, first, may I just say, uh, in response to uh, to Charles, um, I, I believe that there are no permanent solutions. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it, it's kind of this is a, a depressing fact that has been borne in upon me recently for various reasons. That you you, you the, any ground you win is only a temporary uh, a temporary victory, and you have to you can't assume that um, that. People understand why a free market works better than a centrally controlled uh, economy. You, you, that that, that um, needs to be explained anew every morning. And uh, the, the dangers of, for example, socialized, uh, you know, national health care and so on, I mean, I, the, the, you know, that, the tip of the iceberg, but that would be, a, you know, a huge thing. And, and National Review would have to be there, um, as other institutions would be, arguing against it, you know, morning, noon, and night. I, I think that, you know, um, Somebody mentioned Tocqueville earlier. The 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 you know uh, famously he, he said that if despotism were to come to a democracy, it wouldn't tyrannize people; it would infantilize them, and it would do this by, you know, propagating all these rules and regulations that would reach into the interstices of everyday life. And that you, I mean, if anything, uh, you know, we we live in an increasingly uh, despotic society. So these victor we, there have been certain victories, uh, conservative victories, but um, but but you know we're all socialists now. Is was it uh, the, uh, Edward the Eighth said? I think I forget who said that, but but he was right, and we're even we're more socialists now than than uh, than we were then, and um, it's a kind of a permanent permanent battle, I think. Um, as for um, Buckley at home, Buckley at home. Uh, well, we um, we uh, it's true that we would see him, uh, my wife and I, m most uh, Sundays when he was um, when he was in uh, Connecticut. We would uh, uh, Father uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick, who's here in the audience, I think, would say a, a Latin mass uh, for uh, us, and um, that's us out, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, then we would go, that, this would be at a, at a local chapel, and then we would go back to his house and have some, uh, he, he and my wife would play the piano, and we'd have drinks and sometimes dinner. But, um, mm. it, you know, it was, they, we rarely talked about politics, but we almost always watched 60 Minutes. He loves 60 Minutes. Uh, <laughs> so that, <laughs> that we can forgive him. Yeah. <laughs> And 60 Minutes was fair to him twice, I think, in two different segments, the two they did. That counted for something. Well... It is audience participation time, and I see first Judge Thomas Grisset, and uh, a microphone will come, Judge, and uh, I've identified you, so you don't have to identify yourself, although I'll ask others to do so if I don't know them. And you can direct the question to an individual or to the panel generally. Tom Grisset. I think this is for Richard Lowry. Uh, William Buckley seems to me to have been not an individual, but a kind of movement. But there was, there's also a movement that uh, Irving Kristol, who doesn't write anymore particularly, but the neoconservatives, Irving Kristol, Norman Podoritz, Nathan Glazer, and in my mind, they uh, are somewhat separate. And could you just comment on the relationship or the separation uh, of what I consider two groups? Yeah, well, um, all in a minute or so, of course. Oh, yeah, right, of course. Right. Teasing, um, sort of. Well, first Such of all, I didn't question. mean to suggest that Bill didn't have any, because he was an individual, didn't have any role in forming the movement. Of course, you can, you can do both, and, and he did. And there was kind of, in the early days, sort of a laying of hands you know, Bill Buckley on, um, you know, almost every major institution of, of conservatism for 30 or 40 years. And um, as far as the, the neoconservatives go, you know, Bill had a very welcoming attitude toward converts. And uh, what the neoconservatives represented, represented was very important rebellion of um, a slice of liberals 
against the radical left. And if you look at the kind of policy ideas that Bill advocated in his mayoral campaign in 1965, a lot of them you know, would show up in the magazine, uh, the neoconservative organ that coincidentally was founded in the same year, the public interest. Now, they're obviously, so to, to a large extent, neoconservatives have been subsumed into the larger conservative movement, and I think you know, correctly, but there still are you know, different tendencies and tensions within conservatism, and the neocons are uh, less anti-government and have a more crusading attitude uh, toward our fo foreign policy and uh, a, a greater uh, faith in our ability to import democracy overseas. And I think at that juncture, if you want to hear more about the tension within conservatism over that question, I should turn it over to George Will. Well, it's, it's difficult to remember, but well to remember, that neoconservatism didn't acquire a foreign policy. It is now defined as a foreign policy, but it didn't even speak to foreign policy when it was born in 1965, really, with the founding of the public interest. Then it had distinguished social scientists, Pat Moynihan, Nathan Glazer, Daniel Bell, James Q. Wilson, and all the rest, who said, our point is to apply social science and to say that social science does not tell us what to do, it tells us what is not working. And that's, that, that was a fundamentally conservative chastening doctrine, and conservatism is, if nothing else, always chastening which is why it is peculiar that neoconservatism now is understood primarily as a completely unchastened foreign policy. George, you remember the first to use the word neoconservative. It was a put down. It was Michael Harrington. Really? And he meant uh, anti-socialist. I think he applied it to Irving Kristol. Yeah. It didn't have a thing to do with foreign policy. Quite right. Who else? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Uh, George Packer from the New Yorker magazine. Um, just for the whole panel, movements don't last forever. And I'm wondering if Buckley's movement still exists as a movement rather than as institutions and part of public policy. Does it? You've talked about the, the conservative movement. I'm wondering if it still exists as a movement. I think we may be too big for a movement, but maybe Charles Kessler disagrees. Would you speak to that for a minute? Well, I, I mean, the. Um the movement uh, it still exists, but it has changed its uh, uh, in various ways since the defeat of communism. I think uh, in the in the initial formulation of it that Bill helped so much to engineer, uh, anti-communism was a, was supposed to be uh, the, the element that fused together uh, libertarians and traditionalists. Um, with the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union and the uh, socialist model, uh, that uh, glue uh, doesn't work anymore. Uh, you may have substitutes for it, as in the opposition to Islamo-fascism, or whatever mm -hmm. you'd like to call it, jihadism, in the current situation. But essentially, for a long time, conservatism was... Um, more defined by what it was against than by what it was for. Because when you ask the question what it was for, there were contending schools of thought. Uh, now we're in a situation where I think uh, it becomes almost inevitable to raise the question, what are we for? Uh, and that means that if the movement is to prosper and to survive, it has to, I think it has to undergo the kind of rethinking that I've been uh, talking about. And that will mean a kind of, I think, a, a rebirth of the conservative movement uh, which has not happened so far. I mean, I think the weakness of the movement now, despite its vast institutional success and some, and some, of course, important electoral um, and policy successes, uh, I think there's a lot of anxiety in the conservative movement because we don't know exactly where to go from here. And all the questions that remain, especially domestic questions, are very hard questions, like what to do about the state what to do about unlimited government or, you know, the welfare state and the, the institutions of, uh, in, uh, that as uh, George said uh, eloquently before, have been e essentially defined and inspired by progressivism. Um, okay. Liberalism also is undergoing something of a, of a transformation, but, but I think for them it's, um, it's not so central a problem because progressivism is all about adjusting to new conditions and uh, and uh, doesn't need to have 
an orientation to permanent principles or transcendent principles. If you've got progress, you don't need transcendence yeah. because progress guarantees uh, that, that the future is going to be better than the present, and the present was better than the past. Thank, I think it thank would you, be Charles. a sign of maturity if conservatives would stop using the phrase conservative movement, because it, to me it expresses a nostalgia for a, a heroic period when conservatism was a tiny church militant in an unconverted world, and it had this sense of being set upon and uh, attacked on every side and embattled in its survival and doubts. Perfect rubbish. I mean, this is now a center-right country. And conservatism is the, the default position for, I think, uh, a, a, a stable presidential majority. And uh, constantly for conservatives to talk about a movement indicates that the, nothing has changed since the 1950s. Well, in the 1950s, uh, conservatism was more a literary sensibility than a political doctrine of governance. Now it's politics, and uh, we can and, stop saying movements. And George, if we're no longer a, a movement, but really mainstream, we owe a lot of that to Bill Buckley, do we well, not? And that's the Reagan point. and yes. a few other people contributed. Absolutely. And, mm. uh, it, 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 because what Reagan had, and Buckley had before Reagan was on the scene, was the confidence that comes from people saying, we belong here. Mm. And, and not, that, not knocking on the door to come in, we said, we're inside now. Yeah. Well, we, we've, we've talked a bit here about running for mayor in, in 1965, and there's someone here near this table who has run for mayor several times and won. And uh, Mayor Koch, I wonder if you'd say a few words, I'm ambushing you, say a few words about Bill Buckley as New Yorker and the pleasure he took in New York, and just a minute or two about your friendship, if the microphone could be brought to Mayor Edward I. Koch. Thank you. Well, um, I really loved him. There, was, there are uh, two people. It was people, mutual, I happen to know. Well, there are two people in uh, public life that I uh, really had enormous affection for. Reagan, who I never voted for, um, but who I really loved, and uh, Bill Buckley. And uh, he was very kind to me because uh, when I was a member of uh, Congress, he would have me on firing line often. And he could have destroyed me. <laughs> and uh, he never did. He was so nice to me, which is maybe why I liked him. Mm. Um, and then... And, it, and he didn't resent your electoral success, apparently. No, he didn't. Uh, then there was one other thing that... Uh, I, I have a letter from him on my wall. He and there's a second letter that I will put on the wall shortly. Uh, he sent me a letter commending my uh, commentaries and said how he looked forward to reading them. Now, I don't know whether that was uh, just an attempt to, to make me feel good because it made me feel just wonderful, uh, or whether he was really interested in uh, my opinion. But the letter that um, meant the most to me was uh, sent uh, shortly before his death. He sent me a note in which he said, I'm ill, and that is why uh, we haven't been in contact, but I will recover, and then we'll have dinner. Mm. It's a very short note. All of the notes were uh, short. And um, I thought to myself, uh, I, that would be just wonderful uh, to do. And so when I ultimately wrote uh, uh, my few words uh, for National Review, uh, what I uh, said uh, was, I can hardly wait. Marvelous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. We're going we're gonna to have a quick question from the front row, followed by a quick answer and then wrap up. So a microphone in the front, please. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Sally Muggeridge, and I'm Malcolm's a niece. And I'm probably the only person from the other side of the pond today. So I just wanted to say I came here especially because just like Mayor Cock, I feel that uh, Bill was a wonderful friend and still is of the United Kingdom. 
and also of Malcolm. And as many of you remember, he interviewed Malcolm on firing line many, many times. So I just wanted to say that I think that Bill, you were talking about the future of Bill. I think he has a huge legacy. I'm proud owner of every one of his novels, and I'm a proud owner of nearly every one of the books that he wrote. So I just wanted to say that it's a privilege to be here. It's been a great discussion, and taking away just the sort of party political element of it, I think Bill has a legacy that will go on for a long time, both sides of the Atlantic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bill, uh, Bill uh, hated to be reminded that he wrote The King of England about age eight, demanding that he repay his war debt, or that he pay his debt. He, he, didn't, he called it, he didn't like being reminded of demand a recount. You know, what would be a first move if elected mayor of New York, demand a recount. I'd rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston Telephone book than by the faculty of Harvard. He said, he said these are my Rachmaninoff's prelude in C-sharp minor. Um, this prelude was such a big deal when Rachmaninoff was alive, and he was always asked to play it. And, but that was one of Bill's greatest hits. And I think of him as a tad bit English myself. But he also the Queen. Didn't he ever. His first novel and longest, that's right, Saving the Queen, followed by Stained Glass, which in my opinion, which no one asked for, is the best of the novels, but I like them all. Charles? Um, I was just going to say that, of course, Bill wrote many wonderful books, uh, and we probably underestimate the extent to which his work will live simply as a matter of belles lettres. Uh, that is, that people will want to read his prose, even if they're not so interested in his uh, conservative formulations and from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. And so his autobiographical books, like Cruising Speed, uh, and his sailing books may well be uh, more enduring than some of the more directly political ones because I think as time goes by he'll be increasingly recognized as a major writer um, in a, uh, of the 20th century in American arts. Yeah, and those two autobiographies of a, a week in his life. That's yes, right. Yeah. Um, the second called Overdrive, the first called Cruising Speed. Cruising Speed. I guess. George? I would just say that uh, Kitty Muggeridge, in one of the great put-downs in the history of the English language, said of someone that he had risen without a trace. <laughs> uh, no, one, no one will ever say that of um, Bill Buckley. Well. Uh, when you work for National Review, everywhere you go, people say, Bill Buckley changed the world. He changed my life. When I saw personally people express such great gratitude to Bill, I remember being with him once, it was before a concert, and a couple of people came up to him in just a space of about 20 feet and said in identical language, you are my hero. Yeah. And he'd kind of grin, he heard it a lot. And uh, it was true of a lot of us, and uh, we're awfully grateful, grateful to you. I'm grateful to these panelists. We're grateful to the Manhattan Institute, National Review Institute. Thank you so much, good night. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.